The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you for joining us. We have a lot to get to today. Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors, will be joining us shortly. QS Investors is the sub-advisor on Leg Mason's lineup of ETFs. Of course, Leg Mason is a well-known and highly respected mutual fund company. They currently manage some $700 billion dollars. And they've built that business on the back of actively managed mutual funds. And while there's no doubt mutual funds are still the bread and butter of their business, at the end of last year, they launched their first suite of ETFs. And Connor, this continues a trend we've seen recently of some of the biggest names in mutual funds getting involved in ETFs. We've seen John Hancock, Franklin Templeton, Goldman Sachs, Janus, just to name a few. And as we'll talk about today, the approach many of these companies are taking is to launch ETFs that are sort of a hybrid between active and passive management. They're launching what are called smart beta or strategic beta ETFs. Obviously, many traditional mutual fund companies are known for their active management. And effectively, what they're doing here is automating that stock or bond picking and putting it in an ETF. Nate, there are a lot of things going on here. I mean, our listeners obviously know about the ETF growth story. And when you think about the approach of these traditional mutual fund companies, the situation there, and they want to get involved into the ETF game as well, but they also want to stay true to who they are and that, you know, they're still active management and and their goals for most of these companies are, you know, to to try to outperform the market. And we'll get to, to talk about all this today, but Like you mentioned, these smart beta or strategic beta ETFs are their attempt to do that in the ETF universe. These are index-based, which works well in an ETF wrapper, but these aren't the, you know, the plain vanilla indices that Vanguard's Jack Bogle build. I mean, these these indices look to select stocks and bonds in all sorts of different ways, but they're rules-based, they're disciplined, and that's important. And again, these mutual fund companies like Leg Mason are excited about the opportunities here because they see this major shift occurring with investors moving away from mutual funds to the ETF universe. Well, on that note, according to ETF.com, so far this year through the end of July, stock ETFs have taken in about $34 billion, while stock mutual funds have had $110 billion uh, of outflows. And as we've talked about on past shows, There's no question investors are moving to ETFs, but bigger picture, this is also an active versus passive management story. Bloomberg recently reported that over the past year, if you look at all funds, over $327 billion was pulled from actively managed mutual funds, while almost $401 billion went into passive mutual funds and ETFs. So investors are clearly moving their money away from mutual funds where a manager is attempting to pick the best stocks or bonds. And instead, they're putting their money into passive funds, which simply track the performance of an index like the S&P 500. And at the most basic level, the reason this has been happening is because the performance of active funds simply hasn't been up to par. 85% of active U.S. large cap mutual funds have underperformed the S&P 500 over the past five years. And passive funds tend to be much less expensive than active funds, which is certainly a big part of the uh, performance equation. But investors have said, why not simply invest in the benchmarks? And so that's what they've been doing, whether through index mutual funds or ETFs. As an investor, Nate, you have 
some basic choices when determining what to do with your money. Uh, the first is if you're going to invest in funds as opposed to individual securities like individual stocks and bonds. I mean, this is obviously what we think the vast majority of investors should do is the diversification of funds. But within that, you know, you have a choice to make within the fund universe. You can invest in actively managed mutual funds where, like you said, a fund manager is tasked with the difficult job of picking individual stocks or bonds to hope to beat whatever benchmark they're tracking. Or you can invest in passively managed index funds, which simply own the underlying stocks or bonds of a particular index, like you know the S&P being the most obvious example there. It's, ex- it's become exceedingly clear that investors over the past five to ten years have overwhelmingly preferred the latter of the two choices. Yeah, and our topic today, you know, there's sort of a wild card when we talk about index funds, because when you look at the flows into quote-unquote passive funds, part of this trend is investors buying smart beta or strategic beta ETFs. And as we mentioned, these are index-based funds But the index these funds track is built differently than a traditional market cap weighted index. Uh, The water has become muddied a bit. Uh, Connor, as you mentioned, these aren't the uh, indexes of Jack Bogle. This is a different flavor of indexing. Mm -hmm. If you think about a traditional index fund, it simply weights the stocks it owns based on the market value of the companies. So if the market value of Apple is bigger than Exxon, then Apple will have a bigger weighting in a market cap weighted ETF compared to Exxon. That's all market cap weighting is. And when I say market cap, that's simply the share price of a company times the number of shares outstanding. So if Apple is worth $600 billion and uh, Exxon is worth $350 billion, Apple is going to have nearly double the weight in the fund. What smart beta ETFs seek to do is break this relationship between share price and weighting in a fund and instead use some other criteria to determine both what stocks to own and how much of those stocks to own. So when you look at the smart bait ETFs, there are all sorts of different flavors available. Low volatility and dividend-focused smart beta are are clearly two of the most popular sectors here in the smart beta universe, but there are many, many other smart bait ETFs being launched on a monthly basis with numerous other factors besides the traditional market cap weight that's being used by, you know, quote-unquote plain vanilla indexes. Right now, Nate, according to ETF.com, there are over 700 smart beta ETFs with over $500 billion invested in them. That's, boy, just over, you know, uh, a fifth, 20% of the total ETF assets. So this is not a small piece of the ETF pie. And you're, you know, you're so you're absolutely right that smart bait ETFs are a big and even ra- rapidly growing part of this trend in overall ETF investment. Well, here's the thing about smart beta ETFs. We said these are really a hybrid between active and passive management. If you think about this in many respects, what smart beta ETFs do is what active mutual fund managers have been doing all along. Most mutual fund managers have some sort of criteria they use to try and find stocks that might outperform the market. They might be looking for companies with consistently growing earnings or companies with high dividends or momentum stocks. If you talk to just about any active manager, they have a core set of investment beliefs and most have a a fairly disciplined process to find stocks to reflect those beliefs. The challenge with active managers is they're all human. And, And Connor, just like you and I, They all have emotions and fears and biases. And when you put them in a situation where they're competing with all of the other active managers for performance and for investors to put money in their funds, they get into situations where they might succumb to those emotions and make poor judgment calls, which can lead to underperformance. With smart beta, managers still have to develop a set of rules to follow. But once those rules are in place, that's it. They're followed, and that removes human emotion and human bias from the equation. And as we know, human motion, emotion, along with uh, investment fees, those are probably the two biggest causes of underperformance. So with smart beta, the ETF, and this is important, is it's still tracking an index, like it's passive, you know, like there are other more traditional passive counterparts. But these indices are constructed differently than your traditional S and P five hundred type index. They're designed to try to achieve outperformance of some sort. Again, whether it's in higher dividends or low vol- lower volatility or 
you know, better momentum or actually trying to generate higher actual returns, these smart beta indices are, are trying to do something, focus on some factor or aspect of investing and do it better than the general markets. And that's important to realize as an investor that that, that is the attempt of these smart beta ETFs. But to your point, Nate, remove human error, re- remove the emotions and, and, you know, the reality of active manager risk. And that's important. That's the hybrid of these two approaches that these firms like Lake Mason are trying to achieve in the smart beta space. And Nate, you, you briefly mentioned fees here, but smart beta ETFs offer the potential attraction of some sort of rules-based active management some factor-based management or approach to investing, but with much lower fees than traditional active mutual funds. And our listeners understand this. The, the lower fees are on your investments, the higher the chances are of obviously your investment succeeding. So this is a, a an extremely important factor in the success and growth of these active, uh, you know, quasi-active smart bait ETFs, the fact that the fees are so much lower than in the traditional mutual fund counterparts. But, you know, I think the key word here when we talk about smart beta is automation because it's our view that smart beta is simply the automation of active management. And when you think about automation in any industry, it usually has the effect of reducing costs and minimizing human error. And as it relates to Leg Mason and other mutual fund companies getting involved in the smart beta ETF space, what, what they're saying is, Number one, we think there are better ways to invest than simply using traditional market cap weighted indexes. And two, we like the ETF vehicle. We like where the ETF market is heading. We like the tax efficiency of ETFs. We like the cost structure, the transparency. You know, Connor, here you have a firm in Leg Mason who built a tremendously successful business based on actively managed mutual funds. But now they also see the success of ETFs, and they want to take some of their secret sauce uh, and automate it, put it in an ETF. Yeah, the the Lake Mason story, I think, is really a perfect example of the trends between the the mutual fund and ETF uh, universe. It's a traditional active manager, but they see the trends of investors moving towards index-based investments in ETFs, and, you know, they have that in-house know-how of how to actively manage, and they're they're automating it for their new ETFs. And, you know, I think the idea behind the pivot to ETFs by Leg Mason and other traditional mutual fund companies is to try to get the best of both world, worlds. For investors looking for more than just plain vanilla passive index funds, but with the lower cost, improved tax efficiency, better transparency, better liquidity offered by ETFs, these smart bait ETFs are the answer that these investors could be looking for. And with $500 billion already in this space and more smart bait ETFs being launched seemingly weekly, we expect this space to continue to grow. And you even add more fuel to the fire with the movement of these traditional mutual fund companies like Leg Mason pivoting into the ETF space and launching their own ETFs. Well, let's take a break here, and when we come back, We'll be joined by Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors. We'll spotlight the Leg Mason lineup of diversified core ETFs. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. 
For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. You want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? If you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers, then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. You stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell brand of products anywhere in the United States. The U.S. economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace, yet many Americans don't understand the parameters of this competition. Why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives? The simple answer is nobody ever taught them. The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, Please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode, so give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Tracy alongside Connor Kelly in studio. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors. QS Investors is the sub-advisor on the Lake Mason lineup of ETFs. Now, Lake Mason, of course, has a long and storied history in the mutual fund space. They currently manage some $700 billion dollars. But they launched their first ETFs at the end of last year. They now offer two suites of ETFs, the first of which is their diversification-based investing approach, which is what we'll focus on today. And then they also offer a low-volatility, high-dividend approach, which we'll be highlighting in September. Uh, Mike is now joining us via phone from New York. Mike, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Pleasure to be here, Nate. Well, Mike, we talked in the first segment about some of the recent fund flow trends with investors moving away from traditional active management and moving towards index-based approaches, including so-called smart beta. And the Lake Mason ETFs we'll look at today fall into that smart beta category. To begin with today, how do you generally define smart beta and why are investors putting money to work here? Sure. It's a great question. And unfortunately, the name smart beta... uh gives a lot of people heartburn just because uh, in terms of the disagreements in terms of what it actually means. But the common definition is these are rules-based strategies that are typically screening the index for certain characteristics and are weighting it in a non-market cap weighted function. But unfortunately, that's where the similarities with these smart beta strategies stop. Um, They're more different than alike in that regard. And that's why it's really important to look 
beyond the name and look towards the outcome that these smart beta strategies deliver. And that's going to be really what's important when investors should be focusing on. And, Mike, why do you think investors uh, have been gravitating towards smart beta approaches? Well, I think a lot of these approaches, while they, they seem new to be wrapped in the ETF wrapper, are not actually new investment strategies. They're just taking some of the benefits of traditional active management, like um, screening stocks for things like profitability or quality or, or value metrics, but combining it with some of the great features that investors have come to love from passive investments, particularly from ETFs, full transparency, a rules-based process where they don't have to worry about style drift or a manager going off the rails and doing something he shouldn't be. So it's just combining those two advantages. And I think a lot of other investors are starting to realize some of the shortcomings with more traditional market cap-weighted ETFs. Well, Mike, let's talk about some of those shortcomings because I know you have some very specific views uh, regarding shortcomings of traditional market cap weighted indexes. And I thought perhaps we could take this in two pieces. First, I want to talk about sector exposure. What's the potential issue with sector exposure in a market cap weighted approach? Sure. And, and as most of your viewers, I'm, I'm sure, realize that you know when we construct a market cap weighted index, you're weighting stocks based on that stock's market capitalization or size. So in, in a sense, the bigger a stock becomes or the higher a price moves, the more exposure you'll have. So the first part is that's a strategy where you're going to be buying high and selling low, right? So it's not exactly a great investment principle. But the other thing that we were talking about is really about when when these exposures are getting so high, it can really tilt your portfolio and become a very concentrated exposure. So, you know, when we talked about sector before, people look at broad-based indices like the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000. They think that they're really diversified because they're investing in so many different stocks. But when you actually cut it a different way and you look at sector allocation, for example, you'll find that it's actually pretty concentrated. You know, currently the S&P 500 or Russell 3 has about 50% exposure in just three sectors, um, financial, information technology, and healthcare. And in periods of market bubbles, that can get pronouncedly worse, right? So if you remember back in the technology bubble back in the 90s, you know, technology alone was almost 35% of the index. Now, Mike, I know another shortcoming you see in market cap weighting uh, is country exposure. Uh, why is that an issue? So when you actually look at some of the key drivers of returns in, in equity markets, what you find is an enormous amount of that return profile comes from what country that stock is based out of, um, and what line of business they're in, and then their sector exposure. And just like you have in domestic ETFs, when you look abroad at international ETFs, thinking you're getting a very diversified international exposure, what you often end up with is a highly concentrated ETF in just a couple of countries. So if you take the MSCI EFA, for example, which is you know a very popular index to benchmark for international developed exposure, you'll find that two countries represent almost 45% of your exposure, and that's the UK and Japan. So for an investor thinking he's buying this really diversified international exposure, he ends up really getting a whole lot of exposure to just two countries. Now, the question is, what's the problem with that? Well, think about abenomics, right, in terms of what's the potential outcome, and then think of Brexit. These types of macro events can occur and really leave investors vulnerable to just one or two outcomes in their index. All right, so let's discuss the Leg Mason Diversified Core ETFs. Leg Mason currently offers one U.S. stock ETF and two international stock ETFs. And let's start with the Leg Mason U.S. Diversified Core ETF, ticker symbol UDBI. How is this ETF constructed, and what's the goal here? Sure. So this ETF is really meant for a better core U.S. exposure. And like we said, we talked about some of the risks of being overly concentrated, the entire objective of these three ETFs is to really develop a more diversified exposure. And in the U.S. case, that's a really more diversified exposure across industries. So when we take a look, what we do is we actually group the universe into industries. And what we do is we look at the industries in terms of correlations as well to see, well, where are the pockets of risk in the market? And then we group those risks together and diversify across them So we can develop a more balanced and broad-based exposure to the market. And that means we can capture more of the market upside, but when the market goes down, you can lightly be more diversified, and that's when you're going to have better downside protection. 
Mike, can you maybe give us an example of two industries that behave similarly that might surprise some investors? Yeah, so, I mean, if, industries are constantly changing, and that's why it's important to refresh the outlook when it comes to correlations. Um, you know, for example, when you look at the biotechnology sector and you actually look at what the biotech sector has the highest relationships to, well, they have more in common with the tech sector than they do with traditional healthcare services. And that's a big problem because what many investors view in terms of healthcare is they think of it as a defensive sector. But if you look at healthcare's performance over the last couple of years, it's been acting much more pro cyclical. And that's because of the biotechnology sector becoming a bigger and bigger component of that. So that's why investors have to take a little bit more of a thoughtful approach and take a look at these relationships. You know, another, another clear example that's been in the news is, is REITs or real estate investment trusts. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, news has been coming out where they were coming out of financials into its own sector. But when you look at the correlations, you actually find that REITs have more in common with utilities, you know, being high dividend, low volatility, than they do with traditional financials. So, Mike, if I were to summarize this ETF, just, just at a basic level, the idea here is to, to get U.S. stock exposure, but to limit overexposure to individual industries or sectors or, or perhaps industries or sectors that are highly correlated. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Again, we're visiting with Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors. They're the sub-advisor on Leg Mason's ETFs. Mike, on the international side, Leg Mason offers the developed XUS Diversified Core ETF, ticker symbol DDBI, and the Emerging Markets Diversified Core ETF, ticker symbol EDBI. Uh, these take into account uh, country market clusters in addition to sector clusters. Uh, tell us a little bit more about both of those ETFs. Yeah, I mean, international ETFs has been really at the forefront this year as, you know, we start to end a five- to six-year bull market in the U.S., and investors are really starting to take a good look at international and emerging markets again. And we've seen that uh, in the numbers, with, especially with emerging markets being up about 16%, 17% uh, this year. The problem is, just like we talked about in the U.S. market, traditional cap-weighted indices can be highly concentrated in just a couple countries. So if we take emerging markets as an example, you have China up at around 25% of the index. And then when you take in two countries that are highly correlated to China, Korea and Taiwan, you're at over 50% of the emerging market index. So, again, that just puts one potential bet, which is China, at almost 50% exposure. So the DBI approach in international investing takes the same approach we did in the U.S., where we divvy out those country and sector exposures, we look for correlations like the China example, and then diversify across that. So we don't just rely on one bet working out. Mike, on all three of these ETFs, how does the sector or country uh, approach compare to some of the other smart beta ETFs on the market? Uh, in other words, why do you believe this is a, a potentially better approach? Well, it all comes down to what the underlying investor's objective is. And, and that's an important concept. When, when looking at these other smart beta strategies, you really have to look at everything in, in, in independently and determine what is the outcome you're trying to seek. So the goal is if you look at these exposures, you're going to find that we're much more balanced across industry, sector, and geographic exposure than many of the competitors in the market space. But what a lot of other invest smart beta strategies are trying to do is they might single in on a single factor, like low volatility or value. Now, what happens with those strategies are is that they become highly concentrated in just a couple sectors or countries because they're looking for just one particular characteristic. Now, that can have a certain outcome, like give you value exposure or lower your volatility in your portfolio. But for broad-based core exposure, we think diversification is the right way to go. Any thoughts on some of the new multi-factor approaches that are coming out? Uh, how do these ETFs compare to those? So... Similar to the, this, these ETFs, for the multi-factor approaches, you're going to be looking at several characteristics at once rather than filtering on one. And the idea is by looking at several and diversifying across them, it will smooth out your rise. A similar philosophy to what the DBI strategies are doing. But the one thing to take into consideration is many of those strategies don't take into account the industry or country weighting schemes. So they'll pick different stocks based on the factors, but they'll still chain you to the cat weight when it comes to the country and sector allocation. Now, again, as we mentioned before, if there's a particular event in any one given sector or country, you, your portfolio can still be exposed. And that's the thing about um, sector exposure is that there's a high degree of dispersion, right? The average weight difference between the best and worst sector, 
over the last 15 years has been 40%. You know, you think about this year, you know, utilities and telecoms are up about 20%. Financials of the under inspection is down by close to 1%. You know, that's a really big difference. So depending on how you're tilted, that's going to really impact your returns. Again, we're visiting with Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors. They're the sub-advisor on Leg Mason's ETFs. Mike, what might be the downside to this diversified-based investing approach outside of just the normal market risks? So the, the downside to any one of these smart beta strategies is really making sure you understand when the strategy is supposed to work and when the strategy might be um, under a, more of a strain or might struggle more. So really making sure you have the right expectations. Um, traditionally, you know, one of, the, one of the safe havens of just having a traditional cap weight in, index is people just go, well, I just got the market return. Well, when you go to a smart beta strategy, you're going to have something that's not the market return. So you have to understand and make sure that you don't pull out at the wrong time. So, for example, for these diversification strategies, if you're in a market environment where the largest sector or the largest country is really doing much better than everything else, it's a really strong up market, you know, diversification is probably not going to help out as much in that market, so you might lag. Conversely, if the markets are going down and that biggest thing is, is likely doing poorly, you have a lot of other opportunities to do well by being more diversified, and that's when diversification is going to work best. So it's important to keep a long-term view with any of these smart beta strategies. And we recommend that clients look at them over a three- to five-year window to make sure you look at through an investment cycle. Well, yeah, and just uh, to that point, to be clear here, in terms of where these ETFs fit in an investor's portfolio, given that core is in their name, uh, I assume you view these as core holdings in a portfolio? Yeah, we view these as, as core holdings or core complements to traditional cap-weighted indices. And again, for investors who want more diversified exposure, particularly for the international side, when investors may not know as much about their particular or have much of a view on a particular sector or a particular country, diversification is definitely the way to go in terms of being prepared rather than try to predict a lot of these macro events. So these DBI strategies are really meant as that core complement there. All right, Mike, before we let you go, as I look at these strategies being offered through Leg Mason uh, ETFs, these are institutional caliber strategies that most investors would have had difficulty accessing in the past. I'm just curious, what role do you think ETFs have played in opening up these types of strategies to everyday investors? I, I mean, I, I really think that we're at the start of a, a really signature moment um, in, in markets right now as you really start to move a lot of and, and that's really part of the value here is that these strategies, which we've been running in, on, on the institutional side for well over 15 or 20 years, are now being opened up to the retail investor. And not only that, they're being opened up at a very attractive pricing point. Um, so in terms of the opportunities for, for the retail investor, we think this is going to continue and really provide a, great, a greater amount of choice for the underlying investor that's going to help them better manage their risk and really align their investments with their tolerances. Well, Mike, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today, and we certainly, uh, certainly look forward to uh, chatting again in September. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. That was Mike LaBella, Portfolio Manager at QS Investors. Again, they're the sub-advisor on Leg Mason's ETFs. And as I mentioned, Mike will join us again on September 20th to spotlight their low-volatility, high-dividend ETFs. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk Fed in our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese & Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME. Or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. 
Bridge Builder, Plans for Life, Architects at Protecting and Perpetuating Family Wealth for Generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Business disputes are rarely just about money. Oftentimes, they involve a breach of trust or a fundamental disagreement about the terms or operation of the business. The law firm of Graves Garrett offers comprehensive and creative solutions to these types of complex legal problems. Graves Garrett represents businesses and individuals nationwide in commercial litigation, white-collar criminal defense litigation, and compliance and internal investigations. If you're involved in a critical legal dispute, let Graves Garrett be your voice. Visit GravesGarrett.com or call 816-256-3181. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels. Completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. We're always on the hunt for game changers. The iPhone, Uber, Airbnb, all revolutionary market leaders. In the financial world, the exchange-traded fund is the game changer, growing at a record pace by cutting the cost of mutual funds and helping you keep what you've worked so hard to earn. At the ETF store, we utilize the latest technology to help you create a balanced portfolio you can monitor and, most importantly, understand. Call us today for a free consultation, 816-363-ETFS, or go to ETFstore.com. Hi, this is Ryan Weeby, owner of First Mortgage Solutions. If you've heard news lately about low interest rates and want to know if now is the time to buy a new home or even refinance the one you've got, give one of my experienced loan consultants a call at 816-778-7000. If you're too busy to call right now, just go to firstmortgagekc.com and fill out a full online application. Last year, we saved our average refinance customer over $457 a month on their monthly bills. First Mortgage Solutions, 816-778-7000. The Weeby Group, LLC, Kansas License, MC002500009, Equal Housing Lender. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF Store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store show. Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A quiet week for stocks last week. The S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and NASDAQ were all up only about 5 hundredths of a percent. The biggest piece of news last week came on Wednesday when we had the release of the Fed Minutes. And these provide some insight into what the Fed was thinking at their last policy meeting, uh, which happened back in July. And, Connor, before we talk about these minutes, I have to say the Fed is officially my least favorite thing to talk about on this show. I'm sure all of our listeners just uh, jump out of their seats with excitement every time we mention the Fed. (laughs) But the thing is, for better or worse, The Fed and other central banks continue to drive the markets. And so, unfortunately, we just can't get away from the Fed as a topic. But anyways, the minutes showed there was some discussion at the July meeting about a potential rate hike in September. The minutes said, quote, members judged it appropriate to continue to leave their policy options open and maintain flexibility to adjust the stance of policy based on incoming information. Now, as has been the case uh, all along, the Fed also said they first want to see what the data looks like on employment uh, and inflation. That's the incoming information. This was really par for the course. This is basically what we've heard all year long. The Fed is saying a rate hike is on the table, but they're data dependent. 
And I, I've got to tell you, quite frankly, the markets are seeing right through this. Investors aren't buying that the Fed is even considering raising rates in September. Nate, what what I think was, was fairly important here was there was no consensus among Fed officials in terms of the timing of rate hikes. I mean, some members think we need to raise rates now, and others see rates not being raised for you know, more than a year, maybe two years. And, and that's a fairly significant gap between officials. And like you said, the Fed continues to say they're data dependent, but it's less and less clear that that's the case. I mean, look at the, the dual mandate of, of the Fed, um, you know, keeping unemployment as low as, as reasonable and keeping inflation, you know, positive, but, but in a very um, manageable manner. And when you look at those two factors right now, Things are going quite well. I mean, there are signs of, of um, you know, fairly low inflation showing up, but in important places like wages, we're finally seeing increases in, in wages across the nation. And again, the employment rate is still very low, but the Fed hasn't done anything. And, you know, the, the more pessimistic uh, among us or cynical among us can certainly claim that the Fed is now being driven by the financial markets performance as opposed to the other way around, which is obviously concerning. And, and add to that the, the very unlikely possibility that the Fed rocks the boat at all during the lead-up to the election in November. And a lot, most Fed watchers view this consideration of, of September being a quote-unquote live meeting, meaning they will consider raising rates at that meeting, is, is a total smokescreen. Because when you look back, Nate, at the, at the start of 2016, we entered this year with expectations of possibly four rate increases. And here we are in August with one measly rate increase under our belts and the chance of possibly maybe one more happening by year end. But, you know, very unlikely where that could even become a possibility until December. And it's right. You, you mentioned this at the top of the show. I mean, this is maybe our least favorite topic, but... You know, we feel like we have to continue to talk about these Fed meetings because, you know, their central bank intervention is so important right now to investors. But, man, it just feels like Groundhog's Day every week when we sit down to do our market update. Well, and to be clear, the one rate hike we had, that was at the end of last year. You know, we came into this year, as you mentioned, with the expectation that there would be uh, four rate increases. We haven't had any yet. And, you know, going back to your point on uh, the financial markets, the thing that was interesting to me in the Fed minutes was that several Fed officials, uh, quote, expressed concerns that an extended period of low interest rates risked intensifying incentives for investors to reach for yield and could lead to, listen to this, a misallocation, a misallocation of capital and a mispricing of risk with possible adverse consequences for financial stability. But here's the thing. This really just seems like jawboning to me. And think about some of the other comments we heard from Fed officials last week. On Tuesday, Atlanta Fed President Dennis Lockhart said, quote, I think at least one increase of the policy rate could be appropriate later this year. Also on Tuesday, New York Fed President William Dudley said, I think we're getting closer to the point in time when it will be appropriate to actually raise short-term rates again. On Thursday... San Francisco Fed President John Williams said, quote, it makes sense to get back to a pace of gradual rate increases, preferably sooner rather than later. And then just this past Sunday, Fed VP Stanley Fisher made some comments which indicated he believed the U.S. economy was close to its targets and a rate hike was on the table for 2016. It's kind of funny to me because you listen to these comments. These are all within the span of, of five days. Uh, straddling the Fed minutes. These all sound great. They sound wonderful. But guess what? We've heard them before. And, and then the Fed hasn't done anything. This is classic jawboning. Boy, Nate, and, and, you know, the quote you had from the minutes is, that's serious stuff. I mean, when they're talking about, you know, the misallocation of risk and, and investors basically, you know, uh, searching for yield, reaching for yield, taking more risk than they need to, that's happening all across this country, and it's as a direct result of these Fed low interest rate policies. Because think about it if you're a retiree who needs income. You can't generate that income safely by owning CDs or short-term bonds like you had previously. You have to go out and own stocks that pay dividends or own real estate investment trusts that pay dividends, taking on way more risk 
than you should, you know, as a as a conservative retired investor. And the the problem is even larger for the pensions in this country, for insurance companies. I mean, this low interest rate policy is is killing some of these investors and institutions that need predictable, safe, decent yields. And, you know, the fact that the Fed mentioned that risk in their notes, yet seemingly are unwilling to do anything about it, is really concerning. I mean, it it reminds me, you know, of a parent of young kids, of a, of a story I have to seemingly discuss each week with my kids, you know, the, the, that every parent knows, the boy who cried wolf. I mean, Fed officials have been talking about raising rates for literally a few years now, and they are trying to prepare the market for these increases by making comments like the ones you just mentioned. But the problem is they've been saying this stuff for years, and we only have one rate hike to show for it. So at this point, these comments are largely falling on deaf ears. Market participants are at the point of wanting the Fed to actually prove they're going to raise rates by actually raising rates, not just talking about it. Well, I went and looked at the Fed Fund futures yesterday, and uh, as of yesterday, right now, the market is pricing in a very low chance of a rate increase in September, only 18%. And even looking out to December, the odds are less than 45%. So so clearly not great odds. Now, that doesn't mean things can't change, but these future markets are pretty savvy. And I also think, to to your earlier point, Connor, the Fed wants to avoid any rate hike getting politicized. They don't want to get caught up uh, in politics, especially with this particular uh, election. Mm-hmm. If they hike rates before November and then stocks and bonds crater, some voters might attribute that to the incumbent party, and the Fed doesn't want to be involved in that. So I, I think we're going to see a, a lot more of the same through the rest of the year unless something substantial changes. You know, I really think that the Fed blew it in June when they had every reason to raise rates and then let the short-term shock of the Brexit keep them from doing that. Because as we get closer and closer to this election, it's very clear that the Fed is extremely unlikely to to, to do anything to rock the boat, as you very well explained the, the ramifications of that. So that was really frustrating to see them, frankly, look at concerns outside of U.S. borders and let international concerns impact what they're doing to our Fed funds rate here in the U.S. was, was really disappointing. Um, but, Nate, I mean, we've been talking about these increases for so long in the show, but, you know, concerns about the, the Fed intervention and more broadly, you know, central bank interventions around the globe are becoming concerns to – you know, average investors, where where most clients that I'm meeting with now are bringing up the Fed, now bringing up you know when do rates normalize and and how how painful is that going to be for us? How much has this central bank intervention impacted the stock markets? And what happens when the music stops? I mean, we're approaching eight years of historic easing and intervention by the Fed. And not to mention, you know, even more drastic measures by the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank. And nobody, and I mean nobody, not the central banks themselves, not, you know, the talking heads on TV, nobody knows how this is all going to play out because it's unprecedented. And there is a lot of concern, and it's growing among investors about the end game, how all of the central bank action is unwound. And, you know, it, it's concerning because, again, this has never happened before. Well, here's the thing. That's why we talk about it on this show, and, and I've, I've mentioned this over the past several years. Look, the market's had a, a pretty good year this year, and if you look at most major asset classes, they're positive. But if you talk to the average investor and you think about the three major asset classes, mm-hmm. so stocks, bonds, and cash, the, the, the average investor will tell you they don't feel real good about stocks, they feel like maybe valuations are stretched. The stock market's run a little too far. Mm-hmm. That the Fed intervention has helped propel stocks. Nobody feels really good about bonds. Same thing. You have rates close to historical lows. Uh, bond market, uh, you know, you look at the trend over the past 30 years, it's just unbelievable what the chart looks like. But but same deal there. There's a lot of fear that as rates start rising, uh, they're going to get bludgeoned in their bond positions. And then, of course, cash doesn't pay anything right, right now. And so the dilemma for for every investor is what do you do? 
And that's why we've been in this environment where investors have had a chase yield. They've had to get riskier in their portfolio to try to find some return. And and doing that has led us to this position we're in now. And, and that is the question. What is the end game here? How does this all end up playing out? Uh, you know, this is the, the you know, cliche response, but it does come back to diversification. Right. When I think about how we're building our portfolios at the ETF store, boy, this is the time where you have to have exposure to a wide variety of asset classes in your portfolio that are going to react differently in different market environments. That's right. This isn't the time to be to be loading up on uh, a bunch of investments that are all going to react the same. Well, and and nobody knows the timing of when this is going to, you know, I don't want to say collapse or crash, but nobody knows the timing of, of when the market is going to peak out, right? You can't call tops. You can't call bottoms. You need to be diversified. You need to own international bonds. You need to own investment-grade bonds in the U.S. You need to have you know, short-term and intermediate-term duration in your bonds. You need to own gold. You need to own real estate. Um, for more consumer investors, a cash buffer makes sense. Um, so those are the conversations we're having uh, with our clients. But again, there's a lot of concern and fear out there about how this central bank fueled run over the past several years is going to unwind. Yeah, and I don't want to paint it as all doom and gloom. Perhaps, you know, the Fed is able to uh, orchestrate, you know, their way out of this environment. But I do think that it's valid to have some concerns. And I think the approach you take to investing and the approach you take in your portfolio should reflect that accordingly. As much as I hate talking about this subject, it will certainly be interesting watching it all unfold. Uh, And we should note that Janet Yellen will be speaking at Jackson Hole on August 26th. This is always a highly anticipated event. Uh, We'll see if anything new comes out of that. And then the next Fed meeting is September 20th uh, and 21st. We'll also meet again in early November uh, and then in December. Now, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, I do want to be sure to mention our show next week. Every year we like to focus at least one show on gold. And, Connor, you just mentioned, you know, perhaps owning gold in a portfolio is a is a good idea in this environment. You know, look, gold has to be one of the most polarizing investments. People either love gold or they hate it. But so far this year, gold is up nearly 30%. It's been a very hot topic, and we're excited. We're going to be joined by Juan Carlos Artigas, who is the Director of Investment Research at the World Gold Council. I've got to tell you, he's simply one of the best resources you're going to find anywhere on the gold market. This should be a a tremendous discussion and certainly a very timely one. Yeah, it is. We've had Juan Carlos on the show about every you know six months or so when they release their semi-annual report for the last several years. And um, in terms of the performance of gold, this is obviously a much different situation than when we were meeting with him last, you know, discussing with him last August, for instance, when gold was still kind of dead money, not doing a lot. But, you know, that really fits with how we view gold um, as a part of a portfolio at the ETF store. You know, we're not uh, gold bugs, but we also – believe that gold does have a value for a diversified investor. And, you know, we, we, we view gold really as portfolio insurance, that it should shine most brightly when everything else is, is performing poorly, when equity markets are, you know, in the dark and things are not looking good on a, on a, on a global stage. And, um, you know, year to date, with the start of the U.S. markets being so poor, it really made sense with gold's, you know, great start to the year. But here we are in August, and U.S. stocks are up, emerging market stocks are up, but gold is still flying really high. And it's going to be a really fascinating conversation with Juan Carlos next uh, next Tuesday to dig in to what is really happening in the gold market year to date. Well, and even though other investments are up this year, and, and as you mentioned, gold tends to shine brightest when, when other things are, are dark I think what gold reflects this year is the uncertainty out there. I think the concern over what we were just talking about in in terms of how these central bank policies play out and with rates continuing to stay low, negative in Mm -hmm. in many places around the world, the opportunity cost of owning gold is very low. Because you have to remember, gold doesn't pay interest. Gold doesn't pay dividends. That's obviously one of the knocks on gold. But on on the other hand, 
you know, gold is that portfolio insurance. And so, as you mentioned, we don't advocate backing up the truck on gold. We think having a small allocation of portfolio uh, is valuable because gold tends to react differently than other investments in, in your portfolio. So, again, you'll certainly want to uh, catch the show next week. We will have to leave it there as we are to, uh, out of time for today's show. I want to thank Mike LaBella of QS Investors for spotlighting the Lake Mason Diversified Core ETFs today. And as always, just a reminder that our conversation with Mike, along with all of our guest interviews, are available at the ETF Expert Corner at ETFstore.com. Full podcasts of the ETF Store Show are also available at ETFstore.com, along with Apple iTunes and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. As I mentioned, be sure to join us next week as we look at the latest gold demand trends with the World Gold Council's Juan Carlos Artigas. And we'll also talk about how to get exposure to gold using ETFs. That's next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Until then, have a great week, everyone.